right here, right now, we have amazing artists. And to kick off the show, my good friend for many years and Particle Wizard, yep. but uh, Wizard of Design overall, ladies and gentlemen, a big welcome for Casey Hupke. Hello, everyone. Yes, I shaved my beard off on accident before I came. Um, it's not doing me any better than it is doing you guys. So uh, my wife told me, well, before I left, try to grow as much hair as you can by Monday. I love you, Rachel. <laughs> uh, also, hi, Mom. Hi, Trees. Um, yeah, so um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, abstract motion design, which is pretty much what I've been doing for the last 14 years or so in this industry. Um, I, uh, my name is Casey Upke. I'm the uh, director of visual effects or motion design for BlackBerry now. Uh, the company was Silence. Uh, we got acquired, and now um, now I work at a, a much bigger company in the security space. And uh, let me just show you my reel and uh, just some project stuff I work on, and then we'll like dig into the the you know all the fun stuff. No audio. What's going on? No, it's not muted. This is all the way up. There we go. There we go. Want to start it over? All right. Still can't hear anything. There we go. The third time I've used the Mansions on the Moon track for my reel. Oh man, you know how when you, oh thank you, thank you. Uh, you know how when you cut a reel, you never want to see it again. Same thing. Are you guys also having an anxiety attack right now, or is it just me? Okay, so yeah, my job is uh, I think I, I commiserate a lot with people that work in the medical industry that have to kind of come up with like what things look like, what data visualization is, what does a file traveling over an email look like. It's always a line or a dot. So I know I always have that going for me, and I can always kind of live in that world. But at BlackBerry Silence and at Silence, I, I have the fortunate job of like having carte blanche to kind of come up with the design and creative team, like what we're going to define AI looking like, what we're going to define uh, neural networks looking like, what we're going to define our products looking like in this abstract sense. Um, like, I'm so jealous of people that get to do shoe commercials because they get, it's like, oh, the shoe looks like this. Just make it look like that and you're good. How do you know what a firewall looks like? And how do you convince someone that, yeah, that's what a firewall looks like? Um, but yeah, so uh, one of the things that I do at Silence, one of the biggest things is every year, I've been there for almost three years now, is we come up with this trade show package and it sets the tone for our, uh, our design assets for, for basically for that year. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll use them for like banners and social pieces and uh, they'll show up in like print ads and everything like that. And, like, and uh, I just love churning this stuff out. So this project was myself and uh, Chris Cook, uh, to and flow on the social things. Um, uh, the concept here was to uh, basically sell our, um, talk about our, uh, our products. And uh, at, at our trade show, much like this, we need to have videos that get people in and get, like, compel them to kind of like come take a look at what we're selling and what our products do. So we create, uh, where is it at? This guy right here. So we created this. Um, the concept behind it was all these little cubes and all these little extruded objects, these were all devices on a network. These were all part of an enterprise. Um, they were cell phones, laptops, Internet of Things devices. These all existed there. And the red, those red lines are threats. In case you couldn't tell, they're very threatening. 
Um, and then the particles around the outside were sort of like our ozone layer or our what I refer to it as our AI membrane. They were the, it was the thing making sure that all these devices internally were protected and safe um, because our company's mission statement is to protect everything under the sun. So fresh faced into this company and started working on this project. And uh, it was a really big undertaking. And uh, just, uh, just what we're going to be talking about today for this specific project is how to create all of this little greebleness and how to create this membrane thing. Because if you watch the video, those are the only two things that exist in there. And I, I'm very proud of it. I think it looks very, very cool. But we figured out two real cheap, easy tricks and then exploited the hell out of it for like four minutes of video footage and promotional material that I, con I still get compliments on. And we shipped it rendering it with hardware render. <laughs> So we were rendering at like four or five frames per second, and uh, it was great because the creative director Drew, Hoff Drew Hoffman, um, I, I showed him this version. Um, after the fact, we, we went back and redid another one using cycles and mixing hardware and cycles together, and did like an anthematic piece, um, just with extra, just for fun because we had a little bit of downtime. But when we when I originally showed him the hardware renders, and then we started showing him frames like this, he was like, "No, man, we get to say whatever it looks like. Those previs ones look way more like data viz than like these things. To me, those look spacey. Let's let's go back to that other look." And I was like, "The hardware render? All right." And then that led to, "You'll see more stuff. We'll talk about it." But okay, let's just get into a demo and start talking about the two main characters of our our our, our thing here. We have our membrane, which is the particles and our endpoint objects, which are these extruded pieces. Um, I'm going to start by opening up uh, this CV parametric selection tag object. Let me just make sure my notes stay open, because I don't want to like get halfway through, jump back 15 minutes, and you guys got to kind of watch this like it's Bandersnatch or something. So CV parametric selection tag was a script developed uh, by Donovan Keith for the Cineversity Toolbox. It's, uh, it's very, very powerful. It creates parametric selection tags on objects. So like every project, we're going to make a sphere. And I'll show you sort of how parametric selection tag, parametric selection works. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and drag this Python node over here. There's a whole bunch of code in here that means absolutely nothing to me because I don't know how to program, and I never intend to learn Python. Um, but if I go ahead and go to uh, my down here, my output, and hit new, it's going to create a selection, and it's going to name it parametric. That's great. Um, next thing I want to do is I want to create a material so that we can visualize how this selection tag is uh, functioning. Go ahead and drop it on my sphere, and I'm going to pass it this selection. Under my parametrics, we can delete this null. And let's go ahead and save this file now. So going forward, if we crash, I don't throw anything. Uh, DS. 01 final 024B client edit. And let's go ahead and there's all so there's all these amazing little like options you have. Like you can select borders and uh, let's make this editable real quick. We're gonna want to editable later. Uh, we'll give it our selection tag. Uh, we can do borders, circumference. Uh, we can change this circumference uh, to to grow. We can change our min max. And it gives us these really cool like selection ranges on um, on the object itself. And what what I'm going to do mainly though, for just for this, just so we kind of start building this out and uh, explaining really what's going on here, I'm going to use the uh, the noise option. Everyone knows that Cinema 4D noises are basically unparalleled, and uh, it's they're, they're they're amazing. They're I've used them in everything. So now we have this new noise tab, and we can sort of control our selection. So if we hop back to look at our thing here, we, we can kind of see what I'm doing. I'm, these, these blue squares are going to either go or they're going to stay. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create some objects uh, to control the shape and flow of our object. We, we want to erode it a little bit. So I'm going to use poly effects. Poly effects is a, um, it's a MoGraph module. Oh yeah, also. It's up in the MoGraph tab, but I use Commander for everything. So I would like to go through these menus and show you where everything is, but I don't remember anymore. So I just hit Shift-C and start typing, and that's how I get to all my objects. OK, so what PolyFX is going to do is going to give me controls over all the individual pieces and let me control and scale and change them, move them, just like a clone or an instance would be used in a MoGraph, a cloner object, matrix object, fracture object, 
Voroni fracture object, etc. Uh, I'm going to make a plane effector because I just want to scale down some of these. As you can see, it's already active um, and it's doing something to the polys themselves. Um, what I want to do for this, this is bad form in my opinion, but I'm going to put this plane effector under the poly effects. It'll make sense as we go down. I just don't want to get the plane effector lost. We're going to build out like five layers and I want to know where each one is. It does nothing by being a child. It hurts nothing, but if you look at someone's file and you see effectors under poly effects, you're like, what are you doing? Um, okay. So we're going to go ahead and have this scale everything down. And what I'm going to use for scale is a banana. And I'm going to use a uh, falloff source. And what I'm going to do with this falloff source is I'm going to give it a, uh, a thinking particles group. That's right. We're bringing thinking particles out. And I'm going to create just a couple groups really quick to, uh, to push along the project. These thinking particle groups are going to be used in a matrix object to generate points on the selection tag that we have here. And then we're going to use them in the plane effector as a source falloff to scale down those, those pieces only. So let me go ahead and create a matrix object. And I'm going to change it from grid array to object mode. I'm going to pass our sphere. I'm going to have it generate thinking particles. And then I'm going to provide it with group one. Now our particles are purple. In the matrix object itself, I'm going to go ahead and say, only iterate your points on this selection tag. And I would like them to be located in polygonal center. So now I've got a little bit of information and data right on top of all those individual objects. So let's go ahead and turn back on poly effects into the plane effector. See just our lonely little matrices floating in the wind. And let's drag in group one. Now we're accessing those thinking particles as points to drive our source fall off as a field. Um, I'm sure everyone knows fields and digs into fields. You can layer these points just like everything else with noises or linear or spheres or whatever. But I'm not going to get all into that. Um, so I'm going to turn my radius down. Because you can see if I increase the radius, the, the point radius relative to its center is going to start messing with the other ones. I just wanted to only scale down those specific ones. Um, I have some white points that are floating around. So if I just hit, hit refresh a little bit, they'll go back. Because thinking particles and particles in general, they only update on frame reinitialized. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, go back to our parametric selection tag and uh, change the bias a little bit and just get a few less. Just get like a couple floating objects here. All right, cool. Dope, 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 dope. OK, so now we've got one layer. And now we're going to want to extrude these, right? These got to be extruded. So how we're going to extrude that is by adding a Mo extrude. Uh, Mo extrude is a MoGraph module that allows you to use MoGraph, uh, what's it called, um, modifiers, Mo X spell, Casey spell. Um, okay, so we need this Mo extrude to now apply to our sphere after PolyFX has attacked the surface. So all you have to do is select your objects. And go ahead and hit, I, I, you can make a null, drop them in there. I just like to use the hotkey Alt-G to create a group. Uh, now you can see it's immediately extruded it. We have some of our points moving up. Um, one of the things that we'll do to optimize, just so we have uh, enough like points that are just like kind of chill, is just go change this to one step, then go to transform. Make sure these are all at one scale, because I, I don't like the taper that happens. And then let's go ahead and change our, our, th our little distance here to, to two. This is the distance at which the extrusion is going to pop out. Ignore the other viewport errors that you're seeing there. They are of no concern to us. Um, OK, so we have this. But there's weirdness in here. And I'll tell you that like, for some reason, no matter what, I have to eventually go back. And so you can see here we're just going to go ahead. and We can adjust now. We can, we, can, we can define our shape a little bit better. But there's no backs to our extruded object. Let me go to this option here. And I'm going to make sure back face culling is off. Because it's, it, you guys, if you just saw that option, back face culling, it's a viewport level of detail effect. But it chews away things. And it makes it very difficult for me to see what's going on. Um, so I'm going to turn that back to this. But there's, the, there's errors. They're not showing up right now. Because why would anything work in a presentation in front of a crowd like it worked when you did it yesterday in front of no one? 
Uh, so I'm going to do what I know I have to do later and just create a connect object. Because I think anyone who's using, you've been using Cinema longer than like a day knows that if something's not working, just shove a connect object on top and it's going to work again. It's just, it's, I don't know, whoever made that, I hope, gets a, a, an Academy Award as well. Like, they, they deserve one. <laughs> um, okay, so we don't really need all the Fong shading and stuff that's going on here because when we render this out with the hardware render, um, everything was just very flat. So I'm going to go to my connect and change it to uh, lowest, and that'll get us back to flat. Okay. Mobo Extrude's working, but it's only doing one specific thing. So I'm going to go ahead and create a shader effector. Drop this in here. Let's go ahead and bring our matrix object in here, too. It won't hurt anything for it to live there. In my shader effector, I'm going to give it a noise. And I'm going to change my parameter from scale to position. And again, I, like we showed you earlier, I, I want to just drive the Z. So I'm going to change that. I'm going to go into my noise. Um, I couldn't tell you visually what any of those words mean. So that's why Cinema did this amazing UX little addition where I can see what I like here. And I like this one. This one looks like the one I want. Why not? Then I can adjust my scale. And you see where that's going. So I can get a little animation speed in here. Hit Shift F. Hit play, and we'll see some cool little blinkies, which is basically what I want. I want this like mechanical structure of endpoint data, kind of moving in and getting kind of wiggly, and uh, and and just sort of looking in general like mechanical activity. All right, so that's one layer, but still we have this no back problem. What do I do? What do I do? I'm going to select my connect object, and I'm going to hit Shift C again, and I'm going to create an instance. Now we're going to have backs. Now we have closed objects. So it looks like I have uh, MoGraph cubes oriented to the center of each poly, but I can independently control their Z height. Normally, you'd have to clone a cube with a null offset as the axis to get that sort of effect. And even then, getting them to stick to the center of the, the cloner objects is a little difficult. And if it's not difficult and you know how to do it, please don't tweet that at me. I, wanna, I just want to believe that it's difficult. Um, OK, so that's. Layer one. We got layer one going for us, but obviously there were at least two layers. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this, call it layer two, and we're going to make some changes in here. For one, our matrix object, it's now going to use group two. And the reason for this using group two is that when I take layer two and I rotate it, I don't want the points that it has to mess with or confuse uh, the, uh, the other points. Ba -ba. Let's go ahead and turn off layer one, see why layer two is bugging out. Let's turn off these for a sec. And let's just make sure our matrix object is on group two. We see it. Plain effect. Ah, there, there it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. You know that, that feeling when you forget something, and there's a bunch of people staring at you, and you just want to figure out how to fix it as fast as possible. Whew, it's great. All right, so let's go make, make group two a little bit different. Let's go ahead and turn back on our other effects, and let's turn our other layer back on. So we have these artifacts up here that are happening, and um, later on what we would do is go ahead and delete those and just have that circle because we have this tunnel that goes through there because I, I'm pretty sure the only hard and fast rule of a motion design project is at some point you must spend at least 40 frames in a tunnel going very fast. Uh, so just not to make anyone mad, I made sure there was a tunnel in this project. All right, so layer two. It looks just like layer one but rotated, right? Well, let's go ahead and add in a subdivision surface to subdivide our object before extrusion. Uh, right now, you see that it gets all wiggly and kind of round. Well, that's because we're using the default Catmull Clark uh, Ngons. If I change this over to open subdiv by linear, then we're going to get these different independent pieces that now are uh, conditionally controlled by our shader effector. So if I go in here to my shader effector that I was just in and change this noise, I can get a different effect. So there we go. So the big cubes are, let me go ahead and reduce the amount of small cubes here. 
turn off the subdivision surface really quick just to make sure I'm not going the wrong way. All right. So this will be our big cube group. And we'll just have a few small groups of those. Let's change our scale a bit to control where they're going. Crank it back just a little bit. Turn subdivision service back on. All right, great. So now we have these varying levels of cubes and all that action. Um, we'll go up here. And you, you guys can see where this is going. I'm going to copy and paste this multiple times. And I'm going to have, uh, at the end of this, it was about five different layer. It was five different uh, layers, and each of those layers had like six. Um, and then, because you know, uh, free time is so fun, I, I I wanted to. I was like learning Houdini and trying to figure out like some Houdini things. So I went ahead and rebuilt this in Houdini just to see how it was different to build it. Let's just say this. You see these nodes? It was a lot bigger. <laughs> it took a lot longer. But yeah, so this was this was the concept. This was my idea, and um, very very proud of it. Loved working on this project. Loved working with Chris. Um, but we have a second thing that we need to build now. Oh, and then um, all the secret cheese behind. Uh... <sighs> yeah, hardcore no thanks. Oops, wrong one. That's for the end. That's for the end. That's for the end. Hold it together, Casey. Hold it together. So what we so basically just to like look back at this, I'll just play it again for everyone because we're going to move on to the next project, and you know. I don't want anyone to forget what we're doing. We're going to build the membrane now. But so Chris built these viewport settings for this project. And I, I, I personally call them like hardware LUTs because they're always different. Each different project, each different data viz, like our, oh, actually, that's not the one we want to show. We want to show this one. Here's the, uh, uh, ooh, political call from Diamond Bar, California. Uh, so this is all the process and uh, uh, R&D stuff that, we came, that came out of the project. And you can see this is basically all just, it's just what I showed you, but like, you know, quantified by a, a million points. And then I'm going to show you the very super, the super simple trick with X particles using one modifier that will change your workflow um, coming up right after this. But yeah, man, it was, it was so great to produce this at, with hardware render. Not that GPU render engines are great or anything, but I mean, sometimes you want hamburger. You can't, ha you can't afford a steak. Good stuff. Okay, so now let's make that that membrane. Let's make that membrane layer. I believe it's still playing. Well, I got let the end tag play. Yeah, follow at two and flow on things. Don't don't worry about me. I just post pictures of works workouts and kids. Okay, let's build our membrane. We start with a sphere. We actually start with all the layers that we just built before, but for presentation purposes, uh, I'm just going to do it on a sphere and imagine we used what we just built instead. Uh, I'm going to give this sphere more resolution, and I'm going to create an X particles system. Under my emitter, I'm going to go to object. I'm going to go uh, object mode. And I'm going to put it, my sphere in there. I'm going to say stick to source object, one particle per element, and uh, points. So using the, uh, what you can see basically here, all of those dots, they're the layers underneath, not extruded, scaled up slightly with particles then scattered on them. So again, it was just two little things that we exploited and then shot from different angles a hundred times and had, had a great, great fun. Uh, I'm going to change my rate to shot. And let's just go ahead and hit play to see if, can you guys see those? Not really. All right. So let's go ahead and go to our display and change this to one of our favorite methods of, show, of displaying particles, box. And let's go ahead. We'll just leave them like that. I will scale up our sphere just so we can see things a little clearer. All right. So this was a really cool trick that Chris figured out that let us, like, again, exploit the Cinema 4D noises to get something that was like ultra visual and ultra rich. Um, you can drive X particles with any bit of data: speed, age, distance, vert, vertex maps, MoGraph modifiers, whatever you want. You can do anything you want. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful plugin. Um, we're going to use the XP color modifier to change these colors based on 
a gradient ramp speed. So let me go ahead and make an XP color modifier. You'll see it immediately it changes them white. And now what we're going to do is let's go ahead and close thinking particles because it's just embarrassed to be there right now while I'm doing this demo. Um, I'm going to go to object. Uh, oh, first, first. Hold on, Casey. Pull it together. Pull it together. I'm going to go into the extended data. This is new in 4.0. In 3.5, there weren't differences between local space and world space when it came to speed or vector math. Um, so I'm told. I don't know what I just said. But I need to check this checkbox in order to use speed based on an object's deformation where it's not a realistic local space attribute. It's a global space attribute. I know what I'm talking about. And I'm under my XP color modifier. Um, I'm going to change this to gradient by parameter. So you can see gradient par by parameter will use the whole ramp range over the document time to change it from blue to white. That's it. No, we're going to use uh, speed world. And right now we have nothing going on. But if I were to take this sphere and say, put a displacer object underneath it, and then add a noise, and then give it an animation speed, and then go to my color modifier and sort of start clamping down. And you can see I start getting this wavy look. Sure, I could use XP noise fall off or, or whatever else inside XP color modifier to do this exact same thing with the exact ramp. But there's a couple interesting caveats that come into play when we're doing this specifically. I want to use speed, and I don't actually want to move this object. I'm just going to put it at point 0.1 so you can't see anything change. It's virtually not moving. And then I'm going to go ahead and clamp this down. Just keep bringing it down until I see movement again. All right, point 0.1 seems good. Let's go 0 0.02, 0 0.04. All right, cool. So I'm dialing it in. And I can see that the white is the base and the blue is the modified. Um, so what we're recreating here is uh, let's close this, go here. Uh, this shot right here where we have the particles wrapping around. There's all these other cool little layers of noise that are animating. And what Chris and I basically did was take fall-offs. They were fall-offs then, not fields. Back in my day, we didn't have fields. Uh, so I'm going to use a torus field, because that's going to represent the, uh, the hit that happens. Uh, one of these handles is going to let me pull it out the way that I want it to. OK. And now. I'm going to make it a little taller. And now I'm going to pause. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to create a Y keyframe. I'm going to jump to the end of my document. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm going to move this down. Select that. Change my keyframe. Go to the end. Move it up. Click my keyframe. And then I'm going to go right click. Animation, show track, and I'm going to hit tab to see the curve. Whenever I'm doing like R&D work on particles or anything, like I pretty much just stay away from eases altogether. So I'll just look at this track. It's already selected, and I'll just hit Alt-L to make it linear. And then I'll go ahead and go back, hit play. All right, so we have some cool little movie bits. And we would basically like take. Our fields, oh, I got to put it back in there too, right? I got to give it both. Yeah, there we go. We'd layer up the, we'd layer up the fall offs and, uh, and, and change like, how the noise for the displacers were working. Like we'd have this one. Actually, let's just duplicate this. Let's go to our timeline here, animation show track. I'm going to hit, ta uh, I'm going to sort of take this keyframe over here. I'm going to put that one over here, effectively just inverting it. I'm going to close that. Go on my displacer, and I'm going to change my noise, because right now we're still in the default noise. And let's get like a funky noise, like this one that looks like an expensive, remodeled, open concept marble countertop. And we'll go ahead and just throw in some uh, delicious arbitrary numbers. And let's actually go ahead and stop this in the middle here. We sh it should update at this. Uh, all right, actually, here, let's get them both like near each other. And then let's just go ahead and take our fields here, chord, animation. I'm just going to delete track. And we're going to develop the, the look for our noises really quick. 
So you can see in this thumbnail representation that it's sort of horizontal. But if we want to try to recreate that scan line effect, we got to kind of like squish. It's probably way too big. This one is not working. Let's just do it in the one. There's something about losing your place that is very distracting. Uh, so let's change this back to our open concept countertop. And let's tweak our scales, change our octaves. Uh, but, but I'm just going to try to dial this in just a little bit so it has something interesting. Because what, what I'm going to show you next is why we're using this methodology over just using XP noise fall off. OK, so in our color, now we can take um, this knot represents the birth color of our particle and the, out, or the outside of falloff particle and the outside of falloff particle, or particle color. So if I just click over here, actually, let's change it first. Let's make a cool gradient. I'll go black, and I'll go this side and go black. So we're starting to see our activity, and we'll just start pumping in a bunch of extra colors. Pumping in. And then we can always go like this. Control our range. This is all this is doing is basically remapping an existing float value that exists under the hood and uh, just making it work. So yeah, that being said, that's basically how we created that, that ripple effect and all these extra auxiliary ones. We just had these cool animated noises. But just, let me just kill the fall off so we can see uh, how the noise looks like just sort of unclamped. We get to like visualize these noises in a different way and just one modifier. So if I want to make multiple of them, I just copy that modifier, change the ramp a little bit, give it a, and add my displacer in a different spot. And, uh, and yeah, that's how that cookie crumbles. OK, so next up, we will move on to our other project, also rendered out of the viewport. <laughs> this, one's, <laughs> this one's really fun, um, I think. Let's close this. And let's load up the video. Um, my market research has shown that um, millennials really respond well to video. So uh, this was the next trade show package that we created. I'll show you uh, our script B. Um, I tested this yesterday. So again, we needed to tell the story of our products. Uh, we need to tell what they do. So we created um, a little particle animation that you see on the right-hand side there for each product. Protect was represented as an octagon that keeps all the endpoints, again, squares, safe. Silence optics is this visual thing that sees the space between the other endpoints and node objects, um, and so on and so on. So we had to create a lot of unique pieces of animation for this, and I wanted to not have to figure out how to make a completely unique and animated um, spot for, for each thing. So what we did was Chris, as the genius he was, was sending me over all of these uh, Play Blasts originally on. And uh, I was like, oh, are you using R19's new viewport? Are these all viewport reflections? And he was like, yeah, they're super good. I'm rendering out like higher res and then just like sampling down and then using Frisch Lift to give it a little bit of an edge vignette. And uh, yeah, it's just the viewport again. And I was like, we're going to do this one in the viewport again. And he was like, what, really? I was like, yeah. So we went ahead and uh, the final renders for all of this stuff was R19's enhanced OpenGL viewport. Uh, I'm going to show you how we set that up. But it was a lot of compositing tricks on the back end. The, the other one, while it was a, a, a big marvel that we actually did it the way we did it, this one was more or less like, we can do it. Let's do it. We, and we also had six minutes of animation that we had to get done in five weeks. And when you're rendering at like 10 frames a second in the viewport, like uh, it's kind of hard to, you know. So yeah, this all this stuff was a uh, uh, viewport, render out a depth pass, bring it in, and uh, we'd, we'd animate the little FUI elements and then pixel sorter them and then retexture them back on the surfaces, like I'm going to show you right now. OK. So the first thing that we'll do to set up our, our tunnel is uh, we'll create a torus, and we'll go ahead and change the torus a little bit. And um, we 
OK, now we're where we need to be. So there's our motion design tunnel that we're contractually obligated to fly through at some point in this project. And uh, here's all our reflective cloth deformation stuff. We didn't use any cloth. It was all just like very dense subdivided objects that we baked out to Alembics and then, um, and then it got reflections on in, in, in camera. For the environment that we created, this, uh, this pixel sorter cracked LCD look was uh, from this ad campaign that we had done call, uh, for Silence uh, a couple years ago called Think Beyond. And it was all about you know, thinking beyond what traditional solutions could provide you. Um, come learn more at our booth. So there, that graphic was this cool glitched out LCD screen. And I had to figure out, how does that move? Um, and that's what we came up with was this, was this liquid metal look. With this, this different view of our cybersecurity product world through a reflection of our, our take. I don't know. All high concept stuff. I don't know. Um, all right. So let's displace this puppy. Use a displacer. Chop. Create some noise. The displacer object, we sh we, I showed it to you before, but we use it in a different context that you normally wouldn't use it in. And this time, we're going to use it in its uh, intended context. Uh, I think I'm OK. Yeah, time is going by very quickly. Um, but I will oh, we'll keep going. And I'll give it some more resolution so we can view our noise some more. I'm going to change my noise, make it a little warbly. And then we'll give it some animation speed, because everything needs to move. Ba, 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 ba. That's good. That's good. OK, so the viewport. Uh, in R19, uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit Alt-V to bring up these settings for us. I got this new enhanced OpenGL. It, was, it brought in screen space ambient occlusion, reflections, um, all of the things that are listed in the bottom right corner. I don't need to read them all. Uh, shadows, all that good stuff. So let's go ahead and just turn all of them on. Under reflections, I have this ability to an override my environment. And I'm going to show you why I want to do that. First, I'll create a material just by double clicking in the material area. I'm going to hit pause so our thumbnails update. Drop my material just by dragging it over the object in the scene. And then let's make this a reflective material. Uh, I'm going to make the color nice and dark so the reflections pop. I'm going to go to Reflectance. And I'm going to change this from, uh, from Specular to GGX, because GGX is uh, it's the one I used. Uh, I'm going to bring my roughness down so the spec's a little smaller. And I'm going to bring my reflection strength way up. And I don't know where this park is or who shot this HDRI, but we're not going to use that. I'm going to override it by, again, in my scene, I'm going to hit Alt-V to bring these up. And I'm going to go and pipe in a a new sky object or whatever. Uh, Michael Rosen, not Casey Hupke. Nab, uh, design frames. And let's just go ahead and grab one of the ones from the project, because we really did just use the Think Beyond graphic that Silence had created as our scene. So I'm just going to use one of the ones that I rendered up, because I forgot to grab that specific asset before I left, and I really boned myself on that one. So open it up, and like you know, immediately, we can see that we have a uh, reflection. I'm going to go into uh, my project settings, hit Control E, or my application preferences. It will load, I'm told. Uh, I'm going to open GL. I'm going to change my anti, I'm going to crank my anti aliasing samples way up, change to MIP map, and uh, bah, bah, bah. let's close this. So it's a little milky right now because there's some other lighting elements and stuff that we set up to make it a little bit more moody. Uh, so let's drop in a light. Um, got our specularity going on. We, uh, so in, in composite, you know, we went ahead and adjusted saturation and everything. But uh, what we did to get away from some of the artifacts was basically render it like 8K and sample it down, give it a little Gaussian blur, and a sharpen again. Um, but let's, let's turn this into a tunnel. So what I'm going to do is create a, uh, a helix rather than manually draw a curve uh, right now, because time is running out. But I'm doing this again on Wednesday. Um, so if any of this stuff I went over too fast, or you want to know more, 
Starship Troopers quote. Um, go ahead and just you know tweet me, Grammy, whatever, and Discord, Slack, and I will happily slow down on something, readdress something else, or explain something in a different way. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and use Spine Wrap. Uh, let's go ahead and add a W. So, okay, so Spline Wrap. What does Spline Wrap do? So Spline Wrap has a couple inputs, a spline and a rail. The rail does something. I never use it. And the spline, it wraps the object as a deformer over the spline. So I'm going to go ahead and take these two together, group them, and it's going to displace the object around the spline. So we're starting to get our tunnel. Um, if I go ahead and play with the orientation of the object's default, I can get it to a point where we get this cool, like, ripply looking surface. And now what I'm going to do is uh, set up how we did the uh, depth of field. So if I go ahead and do, let's try to make this a little bit easier to see. Let's turn our roughness down more. Specular strength down a bit. All right. I don't have a, again. I don't have the res, the samples and have everything cranked up as much as possible because I want the I want the timeline to play. I don't want to be at risk of crashing anything right now, so I'm not going over all of it super hardcore. But the other super cool thing that you could do in the new viewport was have in was have in scene uh, depth of field. So if I drop in a camera, enable my camera, and then go into physicals, physicals, okay, and change my depth to that, make sure I have it, SSAO, tessellation, and lastly, depth of field. You can see that I'm starting to get um, depth of field. That's the word you're looking for, Casey. Uh, all right, so now I need to pull my focus back a bit so that I can, I can have it like in that nice little swimmy, I just bought a Canon and a 1.450 mil lens and suddenly I'm just riding down an escalator and shooting everything with a handheld with a a beautiful bloom and a warble. So as I'm just kind of moving through this scene, I, th I think you guys can kind of get the sense of like pretty much how we started building out our world. We disabled a whole bunch of settings and stuff that were in the default viewport um, that, uh, that helped you know, get rid of that. So if I just go filter, none, and turn back on generator, we'll just have our objects. So that cleans up some of it too. We also, under control E, went in and uh, under our uh, scheme colors, we changed uh, all of these colors to support the look a little bit better. And, and we tweaked a whole bunch of other things in the setting to, again, build a hardware preview LUT. Um, so let's go ahead and zoom back in here. And uh, one of the things that, I, that, I, that we did, and it was sort of successful, but I also want to show it because it's super cool, is so this, does, this isn't even animating yet, the reflection that's happening on this object, but it already has movement. So I knew that... I was going to get something interesting out of this if I could just cheat it a little bit more. So let's go ahead and get out of this camera. Let's go to another location in our scene. Let's go to uh, there. Go. I'll make a new camera. I'm going to go active with it. And I'm going to just make sure that I'm uh, rotated negative 90. And let's go ahead and zero, zero, zero myself out. Move over here. I'm setting up a camera for the all forgotten MoGraph camera shader. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get out of that camera, frame up my whole scene. I'm going to create a cloner object. Ooh, it's 41. I have plenty of time. Nailing it. I'm going to put an end side in my cloner object, and I'm just going to kind of make one of these. Uh, let's put our filter all back on so I have handles again. I'm going to change this object's distribution to Honey's Comb. And I'm going to move it over here a little bit. Actually, because I want it to be underneath this camera that I'm going to call Camera MoGraph, I'm just going to make it a child of that cam said camera. And I'm going to go into my coordinates. I'm just going to right click all of these attributes to make them um, zero out. And then I'm going to go ahead and drag this. Let's look through this camera. Let's move it a little bit away from the scene. And let's take this object here. Y is the direction we want to go. No. Z is the direction we want to go. Let's get out of the camera. X. 
All right, cool. Now we're looking at this object. Now let's, get it, let's give it some animation. Uh, I'm going to use source fall off again with uh, a plane effector. I'm going to do position. Nope. I'm going to turn on scale. Uniform. Absolute. And in my plane effector object, I'm going to create a disk. And I'm going to drop it under here to get it back over to my scene. All right, it should be at the same coordinate as my disk. Pop. And then let's go ahead and make a circle real quick. I want to use this circle and an align to spline tag. Oh, I'm running out of time and I'm skipping over so many important details. Totally jack powering this. There's not enough time. Ugh. Let's go to a new scene. Let's zero out everything and do what we should have done in the first step. Just built it zero. All right, that's cool. All right, so in my plane effector, I have this circle. I have this object. Let's move it over here. Change this disk to be straight up and on my plane, fall off, boop, source. Then I'm going to use this. I'm going to hit position. Let's just do a quick animation with it. So now we have this disk that has points that affect this and work a little differently than the, other, the way you would normally expect um, like fall offs to work. Because we're working on point radius, we can adjust the segments to get like really interesting fall offs that aren't shapes that we have normally available. And I use this a lot. I'll layer in things with just different disks and I'll use points to drive everything as much as possible. All right, now last thing. Let's get in our camera, scooch back. Um, let's make a new material. Let's go into uh, luminance just for this. We're going to go to uh, MoGraph camera shader. We're going to select this camera, and we're going to get out of this camera, move over here, make a sphere, move it over here, drop this on here. Boo earns. Why aren't you working? Oh, doi. I need to. Uh, I need to give this, it can't see them, so let's just extrude them real quick. It's not showing in the viewport. That's very frustrating. I messed something up. Oh, yeah, probably the display options are messed up right now because I moved into our new scene. So let's turn reflections on. And, ah, uh, okay. Well, anyway, we used the MoGraph camera shader in our other scene to, off to the side, animate those FUI elements that I showed you guys uh, that were animating. We just, just to say I did it, we did, we, did, we did them in one scene all together and then projected them over the surface as a layer in the shader to get all the animation and everything happening in one shot with no render engine. So two projects, no engine, viewport delivery. Um, I'll go ahead and end with saying that uh, I'm just very happy to be here. Thank you guys for showing up so early for Andrew Kramer's talk, but I'm glad you got to see me show some stuff off too. And uh, to close out, I want to show you guys the, the latest project from Chris and I. Uh, we just finished this. It was to announce our, um, our big uh, new product launch that we had at, at Silence and BlackBerry. And uh, yeah, it's most proud of this. And we need to get that volume up. Two minute video, if you're comfortable. Oh, this was Redshift. We got over the viewport thing. Tunnel number one.
Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Darth Casey on stuff. Uh, email there. If you have any relatives stuck in uh, other countries trying to get money out, I'm, I've tried to help as many as I can, but just keep getting scammed. Boop. Thank you, guys.